best opening day attendance figures for nearly 50 years shows exactly what the Football League means to its fans. And if that first week threw up some extraordinary results, well then let me tell you, today was no less dramatic. Steve Claridge is with us to guide us through the day's main talking points. And Jackie Oakley is with us to hear your views on your team. I'd like to hear from you if you feel particularly strongly about something that's happened to your team today. Who's excelling for you so far this season and who's underachieving? And it's extraordinary to think that in only the second show, we're already talking about a managerial sacking. Norwich fans, what do you make of Brian Gunn's departure and particularly the timing of it? And who do you think should replace him? Thanks, Jackie. As for today's main talking points, well, there's no shortage of options. It was a tiger on the pitch and he's certainly no pussycat in the dressing room either. Roy Keane won't have enjoyed losing his first game of the season and he and his Ipswich team will have been looking for an immediate reaction at home to newly promoted Leicester City. Newcastle's first home game in the Championship was always going to be interesting and it was. Norwich shipped in seven last week and that was too much for the Norwich board yesterday who sacked Brian Gunn, so how would they get on at Exeter? And when is a goal not a goal? Discuss. I'm Mark Clement and on the day when Burt and Albion played their first ever home game in the Football League, I've been spending the day with the Brewers and trying out the local delicacy. Well, it'd be rude not to. Well, Newcastle just won't go away as one of the Championship's main talking points. David O'Leary, the latest name to be linked as the next manager, before the club dismissed it as pure speculation. But it was Chris Hewton who prepared the team for their first home game of the season. And Dan O'Hagan was your commentator. Gutierrez. Jose Enrique. Onas Gutierrez here for Newcastle. Checks out, checks back. Gutierrez! Really good save, Federici. Gutierrez getting close to his first ever Newcastle goal. Shot here which stung the fingers of Adam Federici. Good hit, good save as well. Jose Enrique. Gutierrez. Enrique scores, and Miyagi's header, and Federici can't get there. Newcastle off and running at St James's this season. The header from Shola Amiobi. Newcastle smiles. Haven't seen them for a while. Amiobi gets Newcastle off and running. Good connection with the header into the turf, and Federici just could not get there to keep it out. I like the man who would be king. Let me note the man who wants to take over to his left and right, of course, the current uh, incumbents. And actually, uh, Derek Lambias. And here's Kebe as Reading Crown respond. Jay Tau. Tau towards Kebe again. Karajan. Bertrand's cross, good cross as well, almost comes to Shane Long at the far post. Reading's uh, most dangerous ball in of the half, that. Missed by both Davies and Long as the cross swirls across that Newcastle goal and two in orange were a whisk away from connecting. Lovely ball in from Bertrand as well, that. Gutierrez, who's been arguably Newcastle's most dangerous player so far, he finds Andy Carroll. Carroll's ball for Barton. Drammy Obi again! In the mood now, Newcastle, aren't they? Bertrand's break into Jay Tab. Neatly done. Ryan Taylor's challenge. Tab still there. Ryan Taylor his feet in the muddle for a split second there. All the way to Carroll. And here goes Amiobi. The flag stays down for Newcastle. Amiobi with him, Andy Carroll. Amiobi! Maybe should have crossed. Maybe Carroll was better placed than he. But he's got one. He's in the mood. He thought, why not? Would have been a wonderful second, not to be just yet for Newcastle. Barton's touch for Ryan Taylor, Barton again for Newcastle, good possession this from them. 
in towards Andy Carroll, header down, looking for Nolan, but behind it. That was a good spell, it may not be over just yet, kept in play by Nolan, did well, finds Barton. In turn for Taylor, his cross, deep one, Amiadi again, he has scored again! A near carbon copy, Amiadi's header gives Newcastle a two-goal cushion. It's Ryan Taylor's cross, Amiobi's header, as I say, a near carbon copy, Reading done again. Looking for a third goal in Newcastle to surely seal the win. Barton's corner sent in, Amiobi's in there again! And Federici this time pulls up a stop to deny him in the hat-trick. Got away here, and he'll be a good connection as well. That's a very good save from the big Aussie goalkeeper. Reading's new number one this season with Hanneman now departed. And a sent in deep towards Stephen Taylor, and it's uh, long and uh, behind. Oh, I think he's given handball here. And again, Shane Long is it. Was it handball? Oh, the arm's up there, and I think he just really mistimed his jump, but it did strike the arm of Shane Long, and Newcastle now with a penalty. And it was 3-0 uh, here a couple of seasons back in the Premier League, and the season Reading went, Reading went down. Amiobi for a hat-trick, has it? It's Amiobi's day, it's Newcastle's day. And they kick off their home campaign in the Championship with just what they ordered. Three points. And the OB on the spot, from the spot. Newcastle three, Reading nil. Nice taste of Reading defeat for the new manager. 36. Scott Davis, led up by Jose Enrique, support from uh, James Harper here. Davis. Davis with the ball through and the flag here has stayed down. It's Hunt, and it's only just past the post. Noel Hunt there with uh, Reading's strike, which goes just wide of the Newcastle goal here. Was it like for a local lad to, to score a hat trick? You know, a couple at the Gallagher end as well. Yeah, obviously it's uh, being a Newcastle supporter. It's, you know, it's, it's a dream that you always have. Obviously, it's it's been a long time coming, uh, but you know, I'm I'm delighted. You know, it's a great great start for me personally. Obviously, I'm I'm looking to score goals here to help us get back up into the Premier League, and uh, you know, I know I have to have to win with my fair share, and uh, it's a great way to uh, kick off the account for me this season. Yeah, and a nice gesture from Schola dedicating his hat-trick to the memory of Sir Bobby Robson. How impressed were you with Newcastle today, Steve? Yeah, they were, I mean, they were very good. They're, they're a real threat when the ball goes in the box. Any sort of quality, and those two boys up front, you know, are, are going to get on the end of it. They didn't really get in behind Reading at any stage, but it was about quality ball in front of, of players. And obviously anything played to the back post, you know, those two are hovering around and they're going to attack it at every chance. So, yeah, they were, they were a threat all day. I've got to ask you, though, were you surprised with the threat that they posed? I mean, the likes of Andy Carroll and Amiobi. I mean, yeah. we spoke about this last yeah, week and absolutely. you said maybe they can't fire them back to promotion. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, it's very difficult to be totally convinced with Andy Carroll because we haven't seen enough of him. Mm. And Shola Amiobi, although he played very well last week and he scored a hat-trick, you know, I'm, I, I never ever felt like we'd actually got to the bottom of him. Maybe we have today. Maybe that's a turning point for him. As for Reading, uh, work in progress under Brendan Rodgers? Yes, very much so. 4-3-3. Uh, uh, three, three. Um, I think we, a couple of times there, even on the VT, we saw there. Ball went in the box and there was only Scott Davis who was supporting Shane Long and getting into the box. So it, it, it's a particular style of play mm. and people will take a while to get used to it. There's no doubt about that. OK, Newcastle fans smiling for now. Leicester City's hard-fought victory against Swansea on the opening day was just what Nigel Pearson wanted. Whilst well, Ipswich's losing start against Coventry was just what Roy Keane didn't want. Before the kick-off, the Portman Road faithful saluted their favourite manager, Sir Bobby Robson. Commentary comes from John Roder. 
Roy Keane makes two changes to the side that started at Coventry six days ago. Colin Healy replacing the injured David Norris in midfield, while David Wright comes in for Alex Bruce at fullback. Delaney and McCauley coming up against their former club. Robbie Nielsen was suspended for Leicester's opening two matches. The defender replacing Morrison at fullback. Danny and Gesson has scored in both Leicester's matches so far. He comes in on the right with Matt Oakley moving to central midfield. Seems to have been around forever, Matt Oakley, but uh, he's still only in his early 30s, although he will turn 32 on Monday. Forward by Bruno Berner. Fryer looking to turn the defender. Foul by McCauley. Free kick taken quickly. Dyer driving it across and not far over either. What a chance that was for Leicester City and Wayne Brown. Ipswich caught napping. Dyer with the smart delivery. And Brown almost on target against the club where he started his career. Away by Brown. Didn't get too much distance on it. Stead can't get there. Brown with the back header, and it was awkward there for Leicester. John Stead looking to steal in there and take advantage of the weak back header from Wayne Brown. Forward by Wellens. Peters. He's on side. Martin now running through for Ipswich. It's Lee Martin. Needs support because it was a tame shot in the end from the former Manchester United man. There was nobody up with him in a blue shirt. Had to go all the way on his own. And in the end, the challenge from Nielsen was just enough. Forward by Brown. And Fryat's got in behind the uh, defence there. McCauley just out Fox there, really, by Fryat. Decent ball in towards Howard. Half scooped away. And the left footer shot coming in from Nielsen. Howard's height will always cause defenders problems. Wasn't really cleared properly by Trotter. Martin. Walters takes it away from Stead, and that's not a bad effort either from Jonathan Walters. Walters, who scored Ipswich's goal at Coventry last weekend, fired it in, it was curling away from Wheel as well. Oh, Delaney with a little touch there, expected Martin to pick it up. Martin wasn't expecting it at all, though. Can Leicester profit? It's Steve Howard. Foul. Gareth McCauley with the obstruction. And this may very well be the first caution of the afternoon. And it is a caution for McCauley. Fryat leaves it. Dyer! Only just wide. Everybody expecting there that Matty Fryat would strike the ball towards goal. But instead, it was Lloyd Dyer. Header from Nielsen. Gets it back from Wellens. Nielsen. It's a corner kick. It came off the shin there of Lee Martin. Matty Fryer hoping to feed on any knockdowns. Three minutes gone in the second half. Oakley with the corner. Ipswich managed to clear, but not too far. Trotter's header away. Dyer and Gesson. Steve Howard drives it in. Might fall here for Ipswich. Fry up with the shot in on goal. And Leicester City were close there. Good save from Richard Wright. Trotter. Lovely ball with the outside of his right foot brings in right Priskin goes for goal
An effort that was appreciated by the Ipswich Town supporters from Tamis Priskin. David Wright. Didn't quite drop to Martin. Here's Walters. Ma it's Wright. Turned towards goal by Wickham and just wide. Leicester throwing everything they can in the way of this ball. Both teams battling for possession. Priskin gets a free kick. This could just be the last chance of note in this match. It is Damien Delaney! Not too far over. Always going high, always going wide. Roy, was that a match where both teams effectively cancelled each other out? Yeah, that's a good way of putting it, uh, particularly, I think, the first half. Um, having said, I think Leicester probably had a better chances. But it was, a, I suppose, a typical tough championship game where, uh, you know, as you said, we cancelled each other out. And um, I'm sure the fans will go home disappointed not to see any goals, but we'll have to take the positives in terms of taking a clean sheet and a point. There are a lot of sides this year who have got aspirations of getting into the playoffs if possible. Um, so it is a very competitive league and it's we're, we're two games in and we've had a solid start, but there are always things to improve. Well, early days, of course, it is for all the teams, but Ipswich have taken one point now off their opening two games, Steve. Uh, they're one of the bookies' favourites for promotion. Mm -hmm. Are you surprised by their start? No, I mean, you can, I mean, I've seen it time and time again. Five, after five games, you'd be top of the league on luck. So, no, I think it's, um, sometimes it's more about performances than points at this stage of the season. And invariably, the big squads and the bigger clubs tend to come into their own as the season wears on. We get injuries, you know, and, and, and people fall, fall um, to ill health. So I think over the Christmas period, as we say, that's when it tends to even itself out. Uh, Roy Keane has targeted, he's made no bones about yes. it. He wants promotion this season. Has he put himself under unnecessary pressure, do you think? Um, well, some will say yes, and some will say he's backing his players, he's given them the confidence to know that he thinks they're good enough to get promoted. So, you know, you can look at it either way. Certainly, um, it'll all depend on results, won't it? Yeah. As for Leicester, I mean, they dominated that first half at Portman, uh, at Portman Road today. Have, you, have we seen enough to assume that they'll be safe I, this season? Well, I mean, it's, as I said, I mean, two games into the season, and, you know, you're making judgment calls, it's rather early. But on the evidence so far, most definitely. Right. Well, it looks like the main talking point in the championship took place at Bristol. Neil Warnock, it's fair to say, wasn't a happy man. Crystal Palace fans of a certain age will remember a Clive Allen goal that was disallowed when the ball hit the stanchion in the goal and came back out. 30 years on, Freddie Sears performed a more than passable impression of that phantom strike. Now, there's clearly no doubt the ball was over the line, but referee Rob Shoebridge didn't give the goal, even after consultation with his assistant, a decision to reignite the usual debates about goal line technology. And Neil Warnock may have felt Bristol City shouldn't have played to the whistle. But it continued goalless, even after Paul Hartley had the ball in the net. This goal disallowed because Hartley was offside when John Akindi shot. City had let in two in the final ten minutes last week, but now the late glory was theirs. Nicky Maynard scored the cup winner at Brentford and he bagged the winner again, this time in the 89th minute. Just to add that final insult to Neil Warnock and Palace's miserable afternoon. You know, Neil's got his character and his personality. That wasn't for me to get involved. And, uh, you know, he didn't want to shake my hand anyway, but I sort of half understood that. And, you know, I think it was a time for me to become and just step back and be pleased that we got the three points. Steve, can you believe incidents like that still happen in this day and age? No, I mean, <laughs> either the referee or the linesman must have seen it. You can understand sometimes when the referee's unsighted, but he looked in a fairly decent position, um, and, uh, you know, if he doesn't, then the linesman must, must see that, and, uh, no, it's quite ridiculous. Isn't it? Well, I'm delighted to say we can speak to the Crystal Palace manager, Neil Warnock, now, live from his home. Uh, evening to you, Neil. Hello, Neil, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Um, have you calmed down yet? I mean, it's been, what, a good few hours since it happened? Well, I don't, I don't know whether you can calm down, if I'm honest, or something as, as important as that. I mean, it's, you know, it's just ridiculous. I, can't, I, can't, I still can't believe it. I've never watching it. 
Yeah, we're just looking back at it now. I mean, I know you said in the press conference afterwards that you were let down by Gary Johnson and some, some of the Bristol City players, that they perhaps should have played more of a role in admitting it was a goal. Well, I, I, that... I, mean, I mean, Steve will tell you, you probably, you probably don't do that. But the, the thing is, I, I still believe that Reading should have replayed the game at Watford and it cost Aidy Aidy Boothroyd his job at one stage. But referees tonight, if, if they saw the reaction of the players, if they saw the reaction of the Bristol City supporters, they'd know it was a goal. If they'd played the game, they'd know it was a goal. Harry Redknapp phoned me tonight and he said, 21st century, you know, we, how long have we had a man on the moan? FIFA won't let us have cameras on the goalpost. So what's to stop a fourth official looking at a monitor to, for 20 seconds for an incident like this. Are you going to ask the Football League if you can play the game again? Oh, well, wait, that's a waste of time, isn't it? What a waste of time to ask anybody about anything like that. Do you think they'll bother about Crystal Palace? All I know is we've got a genuine group of lads. We've got a transfer embargo on us. We've had a set of lads that have worked the socks off from start to finish. Should have won. Their goal is played brilliant, Bristol City. But then we've been let down with four people and not one person in black could see it from all the... Even the fourth official and the linesman at our end could see that it went in. I mean, it, it's absolutely ridiculous. When he, and I, I, don't know how they, I don't know how they keep the jobs, mate. I think I just... I feel sorry for the players. I feel sorry for the fans who've travelled all day. If that had happened at the other end of the pitch, there would have been an absolute riot. An absolute riot. Because it's only us. Just get brushes away. And no. The best thing is, at one stage, the fourth official was telling me, the, the, the linesman at the far end there, he was that busy him, he's trying to invent a free kick. But I'm, I bet they watch the television and they know there's no, no thing as a free kick. Yeah, Neil, look, let me ask you this. I mean, we're seeing pictures now. I mean, you're remonstrating with the fourth official and with Gary Johnson. Let me ask you this. If the boot was on the other foot and it happened against you, would you have been happy to hold your hands up and admit that that was a goal? Well, it's happened once before. I, I look at it. I look at the red. I look at the Reading situation at Watford, and you might say no because uh, because it's me. But I think they should have just gone down the pitch and dribbled and put the ball in the net, mate. And it's happened in previous things. When it's as obvious as that and as blatant as that, it absolutely stinks. I think when it when 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 you can't get a genuine goal like that at a place like that. Okay, hey Neil, uh, good to talk to you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Cheers, Manish. OK, Neil Warnock. Uh, all right, we'll have more from the Championship in a moment, but first let's reflect on the first sacking of the season after just one league game. Shipping seven goals in your first match of the season at home, especially against your local rivals, isn't going to win you too many fans. Norwich gave Brian Gunn the reaction he wanted in the Carling Cup in midweek, but the club weren't willing to give Gunn the reaction he wanted, and he's gone. Well, Ian Busserworth took temporary control yesterday as his team headed to Exeter. Nick Hauling has more. Norwich stayed in the West Country after their 4-0 Carling Cup win over Yeovil in midweek, but with Brian Gunn gone, this is a team in search of a new direction. The signing of Cody McDonald from non-league Dartford could be one of Gunn's lasting legacies at Norwich. His pace nearly earned him a goal in the first half. A quickly taken free kick was Exeter's best opportunity in the opening session. Smart thinking from Alex Russell, Marcus Stewart just off target. But things opened up after half-time. 17-year-old Tom Adeyemi, impressive in midweek, with a thunderous strike which cannoned back off the crossbar. The resulting corner from Wes Houlihan wasn't dealt with by Yeovil. Houlihan given another opportunity, and Jens Bertel Askew with the header at the far post, a goal on his league debut from the Dane on 50 minutes. Exeter boss Paul Tisdale then made an inspired double substitution and Richard Logan levelled on the hour within seconds of coming on. Both clubs off the mark, but Norwich still with explaining to do over the swift departure of club legend Gunn. The decision was a unanimous board decision. Um, we clearly made it with a heavy heart because Brian is and always will be um, part of the Norwich City family. Um, but we felt that it was in the best interest of the football club to make a change now. And that's David McNally, the Norwich executive chairman. Um, what did you make of the timing of Brian Gunn's firing? I think it's probably more to do with the shift in power on the board more so than anything else. Um, he, he, people will say there were two main opportunities. Last year when they got relegated, I think he had probably about what it was, around 20 games in charge. Didn't really have the effect that 
the desired effect mm. that we expected, and obviously after the 7-1, but there was a, there was a reaction. They, they, they win in midweek, 4-0, and, you know, and, and they've obviously, that was the same team that won in midweek. He made five changes, uh, so the reaction was there, but obviously I think the shift in power on the board had made their minds up that whatever happened, that you know, if they did gain control, then uh, Brian Gunn was going to be relieved of his duties, and that's exactly what's happened. Do you get the impression there's a success awaiting in the wings? Well, I mean, obviously Ian Butterworth is, is, is well versed at the club. He knows, he knows the club inside out. Um, they, they won't want to rush this one because the last three you know, haven't exactly pulled up any trees. So they want to get this one right. OK, well, let's see if Norwich fans are emailing and texting through. Uh, Jackie, what have you got for us? Yeah, the Norwich fans are very much in touch. Jack Twine says, as a Norwich fan on Brian Gunn, one disastrous result doesn't make a bad manager or a bad season. Craig from Norwich, I can't believe Brian Gunn's been sacked after one poor result. He deserved more time, but we should try and get Gordon Strachan now. Brian Gunn says, Jack, the sacking was a disgrace. He wasn't given a fair chance to prove what he could do, and he blames the board and Dan in Banbury. Uh, says, I think Ian Dowie would be a good choice for the Norwich job. A.D. Boothroyd has also been mentioned. I actually spoke to him earlier this evening. He said he's had no contact whatsoever from Norwich, but that he is looking to get back into the game. And uh, he did, of course, have those three years at Norwich as a youth team coach. So he's a potential candidate. Uh, on the Newcastle-Reading game, Alison, a Royals fan, says, well done, Newcastle. Reading's faults today. Shane Long was in isolation up front. Rogers, do us a favour and buy Tommy Smith. I think Watford might have something to say about that and the Ipswich Leicester game Paul in Hove says Leicester the surprise team mark my words we're defending well and creating chances now on that Bristol City Crystal Palace game Tom Hoffman says as a Palace fan at Ashton Gate today I can't believe the goal from Freddie Sears wasn't given the FA want us to respect referees how do they expect us to do that if things like this are going to happen Warnock went as mad as the fans and good because he needs to make his feelings shown and James from Croydon, we're up against it this season with finances, etc., and could do with the FA and referees at least doing their jobs properly. The FA will probably stick up for the officials and turn a blind eye and just find both Warnock and Jordan, as per usual, what's new. Well, there is previous, by the way, between these two clubs. In, last May, in the playoff semi-finals, at Bristol City booked their place in the final, and Neil Warnock was allegedly punched by a Bristol City fan, and Simon Jordan claimed to have been verbally assaulted. So, a little bit of previous. No love lost. OK, thanks, Jackie. Not the first time, of course, Palace uh, have been shortchanged by match officials. Clive Allen, 1980. You can look that one up. So wins in the Championship proving to be as elusive as last week. Let's see now how some of the other teams got on, starting with Blackpool, whose manager Ian Holloway told us last week that he wants to change their mindset from purely surviving. Derby travelled to Scunthorpe for the first time in 45 years to face a side who had a brutal welcome back into the championship on the opening day. Derby's last trip to this part of North Lincolnshire had seen the Iron win 3-2. And they were put on their way to a repeat by last season's top scorer, Gary Hooper. Derby had beaten Peterborough last week and they were looking to win their first two league games of a season for the first time since Brian Clough was in charge. Paul Green's quick equaliser gave Nigel a chance of emulating his father. But Derby had been the victim of one of the principal Carling Cup shocks in the week when they were defensively exposed by Rotherham. And Hooper added his and Scunthorpe's second just before half-time. Two goals towards equaling last season's tally of 30. Nigel Clough's reaction was to bring Chris Commons on for James McEverly early in the second half and the Scottish international scored Derby's second equaliser after Joe Murphy's foul on Paul Green. Commons, who featured in the Scots World Cup qualifier in Norway on Wednesday, hoping to end a bad week on the up. But it didn't happen. As the Rams elected to push for a winner rather than protect what they had, they were exposed. Martin Wolford scored his first ever goal at this level to give Scunthorpe victory. Both Nottingham Forest and West Bromwich Albion won their midweek Carling Cup ties, but both were looking for a first league win when they met at the city ground. It was the visitors who were the first to go close. Chris Brunt forcing an impressive save from Lee Camp. Nottingham Forest spent in the region of £5 million over the summer, but they end the opening week of the season still waiting for their first league goal. 
Chris Cohen did get his name on the score sheet, but only by inadvertently turning Jonathan Greening's cross past Lee Camp and into his own net. Graham Dorans had opened his West Brom account in the Carling Cup and should have scored his first league goal for the club too, a miss that could have been costly. Forrest will be justified in feeling they deserved at least a point, but they only have themselves to blame that it didn't arrive. Substitute Rob Earnshaw earned his side a penalty after being fouled by Leon Barnett. Earnshaw started the game having scored an identical number of goals for both Forrest and West Brom. He finished it the same way. A first league win for new baggies boss Roberto Di Matteo. I think it's a good start uh, for our league to first away game, win 1-0, have a clean sheet uh, and pick up the three points. I'm sure that the, the Albion staff and players will be walking away here thanking the lucky stars because it was an outstanding performance. We should have won the game, hands down. And uh, I've got to say I'm very, very proud of the performance. There's no doubt about that. After two seasons of consolidation for Blackpool, they're trying to take the next step. To that end, the likes of Jason Yule and Charlie Adam have arrived. The task? To transform the Seasiders' home fortunes. But their failure to record just a second home win in ten games owed much to the impressive early season form of visitors Cardiff, who fresh from putting four past Scunthorpe last week, took an early lead through Michael Chopra. Blackpool is certainly resilient, though. Ian Everett securing a point with a finish that belied the fact that this was only the second league goal he scored in four years. I'm not disappointed. I've been out of a job for a year. I, I was thoroughly delighted with the way we played against a very good Cardiff side. So, you know, this, this game and this, this division is so close, it could have ended in a horrible defeat for us. London Road hosted its first match at this level for 15 years. Testament to the achievements of Darren Ferguson and co, but it's still very much a work in progress. The posh boss had outlined the importance of their home fixtures, but early pressure against Sheffield Wednesday wasn't converted into anything tangible, despite the best efforts of Aaron McLean. Peterborough have lost only eight of their last 55 home games in the league, but that record was in danger of being tarnished when they fell behind against the run of play. James O'Connor scoring his first goal for Wednesday. And but for England under-21 keeper Joe Lewis, it could have been even worse. Jermaine Johnson denied. The goals of Craig Macklesmith were integral in Peterborough's back-to-back -back promotions. 26 of them last season after 18 the previous year. And he got off the mark this season after Tommy Williams' industry. But for the ambitious boss, there's no delight in just being in this company, only frustrations that they're not beating them. We need to start being more ruthless at this level, you know, that's, that's the key. And if we were today, we would have won the game. Uh, you know, it's not good for people saying you've played well, you had a good football team, and all that. I'm only interested in winning games, nothing else. Uh, and we've got to get back to winning games. Last season, Barnsley began their home campaign with a defeat to Coventry. Twelve months on, it was Leon Best who was dishing out the deja vu with a side order of brute force. It's been all changed for the Sky Blues, who lost eight established first-teamers in the summer, and they gave a debut to their newest signing, Martin Craney. But one thing doesn't change. Isaac Osborne still can't score his first career goal. It's now 126 games and counting. Barnsley's job became that bit harder with the dismissal of Rob Kosluck. He'd only been booked a couple of minutes when his reckless challenge on Aaron Gunnarsson led to inevitable consequences. The Tykes a goal down and a man down. But the one positive was the return of Ian Hume. Nine months after fracturing his skull against Sheffield United, the Canadian came on for the final quarter of the game. His return didn't provoke a headline-making comeback, though. Last season's leading scorer Clinton Morrison continued his fantastic start to Coventry's new campaign by making it three in his two league games so far. So the Sky Blues won at Oakwell for the fourth successive year despite a late scare to leave them with the only 100% record after two games of the new season. Yeah, Chris Coleman has got the biggest of squads, but they have made a good start. Yeah, you, I mean, you get the feeling of real unity, don't you? Mm. Sometimes when you lose big players, 
you know, and it's backs against the wall and everyone's writing you off, it brings people closer together. And certainly the reaction to one or two of the goals that we saw there, they scored. They, they look like everybody knows their place and everybody seems to be in it together. And Leon Best, Clinton Morrison, these are players always who got a know all about this. Absolutely, things. you've always got a chance. When you've got that cutting edge like those two, you know, mm. tried and tested at that level, uh, then, then you go in believing that you can win games of football and that's what they're doing at this stage. And talking of goal scorers, Michael Chopra just loves playing for Cardiff, doesn't he? Well, five million for Roger Johnson, four million on Michael Chopra. Chopra. It, with, with all, without um, no disrespect, but it's harder to uh, replace a centre forward than it is a centre half and I think that's money well spent for Cardiff. He was two years ago top scorer in that league, so you're guaranteeing goals with Michael Chopra and he, they're getting a return already, aren't they? They sure are. Well, let's return to the, uh, the issue of Coventry, one of the games we saw in that roundup, and that was, of course, against Barnsley at home to the Sky Blues. Luckily, Coventry got to Barnsley OK, but not every Coventry away trip has gone so smoothly. When Coventry City's bus got stuck in central London traffic in 2006, they had to get to their match at Loftus Road on the London Underground. Manager at the time, Mickey Adams, buying 23 single tickets from Hangar Lane to Shepherd's Bush. Should have gone to White City, it's much closer. Well, now you know. So what happened in today's other championship games? Jim Proudfoot can now tell us. Paolo Souza's first league game at the Liberty Stadium came against a Middlesbrough side for whom travel sickness has become not so much an ailment as a way of life. The last time they even got a point on the road was last November, but David Wheater's header was a sign of their dominance in Swansea. They may have lost Stuart Downing to Aston Villa, but Teesiders will tell you that his ready-made replacement has been in place for a while. And it was that man, Adam Johnson, who gave Borough the lead. The second was scored by a player who, by his own admission, had struggled to translate his form from the Eredivisie into the Premier League. But on this evidence, Marvin Emnes will find the championship to his liking. Swansea have now lost their opening two league fixtures for the first time since 1985. Wigan's win at Aston Villa won't have escaped their notice either. Sunchai capping Borough's impressive afternoon. We pressed them and, um, you know, we won the ball back in good areas and, um, you know, we created plenty of chances on the day, which was pleasing to see because we, we didn't do that at home against Sheffield United. What happens, it's when we make small mistakes against the quality, individuality quality they present. Of course, uh, it's sometimes it's ga game over. It's what happens today. To Bramall Lane, where the visitors were optimistic. Come on, what? But that optimism will have dissipated in the opening quarter of an hour. Jamie Ward didn't feature in the first two games of the season after his Wembley red card in the playoff final, but he went some way to eradicating the effect of the Blades' shot cup exit to Port Vale. United spent £3 million on Manchester City's Chet Evans in the summer, and here's why. Evans scoring on his full debut in a game which the Blades dominated. 2-0, just past the hour mark. Malky Mackay admitted his Watford side were guilty of looking ragged as they chased the game. Frailties that were nearly exposed again by Dave Cottrell. But for Sheffield United, it was a comfortable first win since their Wembley disappointment last May. There's no place like home park for visiting teams. This was the ground that saw more away wins than any other in the championship last season. And when Heider Helgerson gave Queen's Park Rangers the lead just before the break, it looked as though the new season would bring the same old story. That, Helgerson's first goal in 12 games, a run stretching back to January. QPR had won 5-0 up the road in Exeter on Tuesday and appeared to have extended their lead courtesy of Argyle old boy Akos Buzaki. But everyone saw that that one hit the stanchion. But Rangers' dreams of a Devon double disappeared late on. Their goal was already leading a charmed life as Plymouth launched an aerial bombardment. And Gary Sawyer's long throw forced an error from Latvian defender Kasper Gorks to leave both sides still looking for their first league win. We knew that they'd throw everything at us, which obviously they did. Uh, I thought we coped with it particularly well. We knew that set pieces, long throws were uh, very much part of their artillery, and I felt that. We'd done that right up until, obviously, that vital moment, and we switched off, and it cost us dearly. 
A second successive draw for both Doncaster and Preston, but they certainly took the stale out of stalemate at the keep moat. Chris Brown's second goal in as many games, giving North End the lead in an absorbing encounter. No side in England scored fewer goals at home than Doncaster last season, and Rovers found a combination of Andy Lonergan and the post in their way as they looked for parity. James Chambers and James Hayter, the players who were denied. Donny gave a debut to Jason Shackle, signed on loan from Wolves, and it was his centre-half partner Adam Lockwood who grabbed a late equaliser, netting for the first time since January 2008, leaving Preston to rue earlier missed opportunities. So Donny opening their campaign with two draws, and Steve, uh, we saw Chet Evans get off the mark there for Sheffield United. It's important for a striker, I suppose, to get them out of the way early, uh, particularly when he costs £3 million. Yes, I mean, he's, <laughs> that's not his fault, is it, that he no, costs no, that no, sort no. of money? But, but the, obviously but with that... a feel like that must kind of burden him slightly or not? Well, there'll be certain expectations and, uh, you know, they will expect a return on that £3 million, as we've seen before. And, uh, you know, he can only do his best. And if he puts in the effort and scores the goals, then they'll feel it's money well spent. Yeah, good win for Middlesbrough at the end of it against Swansea. Very. Yeah, it looked like the good... Big players, hmm. big name players, played well today. Um, you know, it was a great goal from Emnes. Adam Johnson, as you said, a ready-made replacement. Um, and I, I, just, I just think that they, that they, away from home, it almost suited them better, didn't it? You know, well, this, this is the second goal by Emnes. I mean, he's absolutely thundered that one in, hasn't he? It? It's a fantastic finish. He's only got one thing in his mind, which is, you know, to be positive. They, they didn't have that last week against Sheffield United. And Sheffield United were a tougher team to break down, certainly, than Swansea. But one thing in his mind, be positive, yeah. great finish. They've got a goal from Tunchai as well, I suppose. They can get all they can from him before he leaves. Well, I mean, is he going to leave? I mean, we would have thought that probably would have happened by now. It hasn't. And uh, if he was to stay, yeah. you know, with those two up front, yeah. you know, on that sort of form, then they'll go in with a chance against everyone. What about Swansea then? I mean, they haven't done themselves yeah. much favours. Paolo Sosa, he plays it quite defensively, even at home. Yes, I mean, they went 4-5-1. Now, they've played that system before. They played it all last season. But it's, there's a particular way of playing that. You know, and, and it's particular players that are suited to that style. And you know, we, saw it, we saw it a little bit with Reading. You know, it has to be a balance between getting men behind the ball and getting men forward when you've got possession. I don't think they've quite got that yet. But you saw that at QPR, didn't you? I did. I mean, well, he played a 4-5-1 then and sometimes they bypass the midfield. If you're going to play five in midfield, you've got to get down and play through the midfield. And, you know, sometimes that's, that's the most important thing when you're doing that. All right, time to hear from fans of championship clubs on the emails and texts. Jackie, what are they saying? Well, we've had quite a few texts in, particularly Joe from Scunthorpe saying, please congratulate Scunny on our first championship victory. Michael O'Connor was outstanding today and seems a steal from crew. I'm sure crew are delighted to hear about that. Tom from Derby, a Derby County supporter. I feel if we don't get a loan striker in by the time the transfer window closes, by the time it opens again, we may be in the relegation places. Come on, Clough, go and get a striker. He forgot to say please, but I'm sure he meant it. Uh, Forest fan John in Long Eaton. I'm very unhappy with Rob Earnshaw's performance today. He looked as though he was too arrogant to score that penalty against West Brom. Uh, Rawdon Hollis from Peterborough, an Albion fan. A message to Roberto Di Matteo. Please can we play our passing game in the other team's half? We were very fortunate to get three points. Uh, Matt the Owl, great first half performance against newly promoted Peterborough, but yet again a dismal performance in the second half to cost us all three points. I still believe that Brian Laws is the man to take us forward. Thanks, Jackie. Now, Brentford got off to a great start last Saturday in League One with a win at Carlisle. So hopes high amongst the Bees fans when Brighton made the short trip from the coast. Griffin Park is just down the road from our studios. So we asked Mark Clement to put on his walking shoes and tell us all about them. Brentford Football Club were founded in 1889 as a winter pursuit for Brentford Rowing Club. During the 1929-30 season, they won all their home games, a football league record. Yeah, but Clem, their most successful spell was in the 1930s when they achieved consecutive top six finishes in what is now the Premier League. Well, I'll press you down then, eh, mate? <laughs> Did you know that Rod Stewart was an apprentice in the early 1960s? You think he'd look sexy in those? Griffin Park's the only ground in the country with a pub on each corner, doesn't have an official match day car park, and Cameron Diaz, yep, Cameron Diaz once proclaimed herself to be a fan. Steady, lads. 
nothing especially sexy about Brentford's match with Brighton, a fixture which has often had more than its fair share of goals, but this time stayed stubbornly scoreless. Lewis Price prevented Albion's Mark Wright from breaking the deadlock, while in the second half, Adam Virgo nearly gifted the Bees a goal, and then did his best to look nonchalant. Michel Kuyper's sharp to protect his near post, and the Brighton keeper had to do the same again in the closing minutes, as Brentford's new winger Cleveland Taylor, newly signed from Carlisle, played in Marcus Bean. The midfielder unable to make a decisive connection, as Brighton put their first point on the board. So a goal this afternoon at Griffin Park. Now here's a stat for you. 45% more people went to League One games last Saturday than the opening day in 2008. There's some seriously big names in this league now, and here's how they got on. The two teams who played Norwich this season, Colchester and Yeovil, came head-to-head -head this week. Colchester, of course, had hit Norwich for seven, and they started as if they wanted another seven-goal haul against Yeovil. David Fox opening the scoring inside ten minutes, his second of the season. There are some who feel the U's didn't get the credit they deserved in that thrashing of the Canaries seven days ago. Perhaps that helped motivate Ashley Vincent, who added the second on 18 minutes. Another route was definitely on. But it was a different story in the second half. Colchester had goalkeeper Ben Williams to thank as he pulled off an excellent save from Ryan Mason. Nathan Smith could only find the side netting. But eight minutes from time, Mason, who's on loan from Spurs, curled in a terrific free kick. Not quite enough for Yeovil. It's two out of two for Colchester. After beating Coventry midweek to earn a League Cup tie with Premier League Burnley, Hartlepool had no fears about the arrival of Charlton, who were taking their first ever trip to Victoria Park. But the Londoners soon made themselves at home. Dion Burton punishing Poole's defensive disarray in the 24th minute. And by half-time, the points were all but in the bag. Terry Rackon's cross just right for Nicky Bailey, as Charlton made it two league wins out of two. Southampton are thought to have the best keeper in League One in Kelvin Davis, and only he kept the Saints on level terms as Huddersfield came out meaning business. Somehow the Terriers failed to beat the veteran stopper in a one-sided first half. The breakthrough came on 50 minutes. Chris Perry penalised for a clumsy foul on Lee Novak. Even then Davis almost came to the rescue, but Jordan Rhodes managed to put away the rebound. Huddersfield manager Lee Clark has said that his side have to tighten up defensively, but keeping Ricky Lambert quiet is easier said than done. This time last week he was scoring for Bristol Rovers. This was his second in as many games for his new side. Back came Huddersfield though. Inevitably it was Rhodes again, glancing in Anthony Pilkington's cross for his fifth goal in only three games. And Town made it safe eight minutes from time. Andy Butler's effort coming back off the bar, leaving Anthony Kay with a free header. His first goal since arriving from Tranmere. Huddersfield, good value for their win. And on this evidence, clear candidates for promotion. Orient's hopes of an opening week hat-trick of wins suffered an early setback at Brisbane Road. Keeper Jamie Jones unable to handle the ferocity of Pavel Abbott's shot. The striker's first goal for Oldham. Infuriating for the Londoners, whose Achilles heel last season was their poor home form, it was a relief for the Orient fans to see Ryan Jarvis equalise. After successive 2-1 wins at Bristol Rovers and then Colchester in the Cup, this game was heading for the same scoreline, but not in Orient's favour. Andy Holdsworth's tumble put Abbott in place for his second. The poll followed manager Dave Penny from Darlington to Oldham during the summer, and it's already looking like a shrewd move all round. Plenty of effort and industry at the new den, but no goals to show for it for Millwall and Carlisle. The woodwork frustrated the Lions more than once. Steve Morrison's effort deserved better, and although Millwall had another chance, Neil Harris was unable to direct his header on target. The visitors didn't threaten too often, but worked hard for their point. Joe Annie Insa looked a handful on occasions, a teasing run setting up a chance for Tom Tewo, but the Cumbrians lacking that touch of composure in front of goal. 
The woodwork again came to frustrate Millwall in the closing minutes. Substitute David Martin's effort clipping the bar, and that was as close as it would get for either side. No more Ricky Lambert, so Bristol Rovers need their remaining strikers to fire on all cylinders. It's easier when defenders are this helpful. Stockport skipper Michael Raines inadvertently setting up Joe Kufor inside the first three minutes. A lead Rovers doubled just five minutes later. Defender Danny Coles has had a wretched time over the past year with a serious knee injury, and you could see it was sweet to be back. Wickham and Leeds had never previously met, but the chair boys weren't overawed by their big-name opponents. The pace of Matt Phillips down the left offered an early chance for Chris Zabrowski, but Leeds keeper Shane Higgs was there to foil him. The only goal came just past the hour. Luciano Becchio's confident finish enough to maintain Leeds United's perfect start to the new campaign. Walsall went the last six weeks of last season without winning at home and were desperate to break the hoodoo. Steve Jones' late run revealed a huge hole in the South End defence and the Saddlers thought they were on their way. But Walsall's afternoon began to go wrong on the hour. Dwayne Mattis diving into a challenge with Matt Heath and with one yellow card already against his name, the midfielder knew he was in serious trouble. South End appeared sympathetic. But when Clayton Inch dropped a dreadful clangour, Lee Barnard characteristically showed no mercy. His third goal in two games, and United back on terms with 24 minutes still to play. Keeping them at bay with ten men was a tough proposition for Walsall, and Barnard's flick to Dougie Friedman seemed to have three points on their way to Essex. That change deep into stoppage time. Lee Sawyer's rash hack at Sam Parkin put Walsall's new striker on the spot. He duly tucked away his first for the club. Swindon had thumped the MK Dons 4-1 in the Carling Cup in midweek at Stadium MK, but at the county ground this afternoon, both sides drew a blank. Swindon's Sean Morrison foiled by Dons keeper Willie Garay, and at the other end, Robins goalie David Lucas proving equal to this shot from Jamal Johnson. The game was also held up for 15 minutes shortly before the break, following a nasty clash of heads between Don's players Dean Lewington and Matthias Dumbay. Both were taken to hospital. Thankfully, manager Paul Ince has confirmed that the two players are expected to make a full recovery. Not surprisingly, the incident clearly affected both sets of players. It finished goalless. Tranmere fans have had value for money this week. Four goals against Grimsby on Tuesday and Ian Thomas Moore on target after just five minutes against Gillingham. The Kent clubs made a free-scoring start to the season too, so it wasn't entirely surprising that midfielder Curtis Weston soon had them back on terms. All very promising, and the second half was an absolute cracker from the moment John Welsh took aim from the edge of the box. Rovers back in front, but not for long. Andy Barcham got Gillingham's midweek cup winner against Plymouth and made it 2-2 just nine minutes after the break. The Jills proving a tough nut to crack. But Rovers boss John Barnes found the solution, sending on sub Terry Gornell midway through the half, and the teenager came up trumps. This time Mark Stimson's side couldn't manage a comeback. Their fate finally sealed in stoppage time as Thomas Moore nodded home his third goal in two games. So John Barnes gets his first league win under his belt. Uh... I think it's fair to say one of the standout results in League One, Steve, was uh, Huddersfield's performance against Southampton. Yeah, um, two years now, they've had a right go in the transfer market, there's been a lot of comings and going, um, so they'll, be, they'll, they'll feel that it's about time they had some sort of reward for, for their, their outspend, um, and it looks like they're getting it actually, because that's, that's a solid result, Southampton have had a good start. You know, Ricky Lambert scoring them goals, mm. um, that's a good win for Huddersfield, certainly. He's got a long way to replace Andy Booth early on in his career. Yep. Jordan Rhodes, though, four yeah. goals in two games, it's a good start. Yeah, there's always those little gems around, isn't there? I mm. mean, that, that's probably because of that little bit of latitude in the transfer market that they were able to take him, because I think he, um, he got seven in 14, I think, for, for Brentford. Brentford so at the end of last He would have been season, in yeah. a lot of people's minds as to, you know, acquiring his services. Well, and Colchester, two wins from two for Paul Lambert's side as well. Now, these are exciting times for Burton Albion fans as they get used to being fully paid at members of the Football League. 
We'll hear from Burton uh, a little while, but first, I'll tell you what, let's catch up on the emails and texts, Jackie. Yes, we had quite a few texts in from Leeds United supporters. Perhaps not surprisingly, there are just one or two out there. Uh, keeping Beckford at Leeds United is hopefully a promotion dream. Housen is better than Delft, and Snodgrass should get a Scotland call-up. Will Gunn, I think uh, League One's dark horses this year will be Huddersfield Town. They're the team that people need to look out for as they've signed some good players this summer. And Jordan Rhodes, who you were just talking about, has been a revelation so far. 20 goals for him this season and the championship for us next year. Now, he cost only about £150,000 from Ipswich, which seems a bit of a snip. And I can imagine Ipswich fans sitting at home tonight thinking they'd rather have Jordan Rhodes in their team than see him in Huddersfield's team. Sure. OK, Jackie, thank you. Well, what about Paul Pescasolido's Burton Albion? Today was their first ever home match in the league, and they really pushed the boat out. They even invited our Mark Clement. Their nickname's the Bros, and at one stage a quarter of Britain's beer was brewed in Burton on Trent. Cheers! There have been three previous football league clubs bearing the Burton name all over a century ago. It's taken the current incarnation 59 years to work their way up from the lower reaches of non league football. But in all your born days, did you ever think you would see Burton Albion in the football league? Never, never. Well, you said the football league. A bit, uh, not in my time, I don't think, but I thought they would do eventually. Here he is. Oh, yeah. How are you doing? Yeah, good, thanks. Good. So, first home league game for the club, but for you as well. I mean, you know, what are you thinking? Yeah, it's Leading. exciting, it's daunting. Um, we're expecting a good crowd, which is, uh, which is great, but um, now it's down to business. <laughs> Now, I want you to paint a picture for me because obviously your missus is Karen Brady, managing director of Birmingham. So she's getting ready for Man U tomorrow. You're getting yeah. ready for this game against Morgan today. So here we are at the breakfast table this morning. Go on, was it? Were you just talking football constantly or do you no, forget about it? No, we don't talk football at all. We were, you know, our, our kids are actually going to one of these summer camps. So we were just discussing, you know, giving them all the rules and regulations of what to do and what not to do. And uh, that's about it. When we get home, we don't discuss football. We just. Uh, we have a normal life like anyone else. Yeah, but you've been tapping her for a couple of players. Though, yeah, right? well, she's listen. Got a couple of loan easy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, she's been very helpful in that sense, you know. And um, obviously, with a few of the contacts I've had, it makes things easier. But uh, you know, it it helps. And obviously, there's plenty of people to ask advice if needed. So uh, I will tap into as much as I can. Oh <laughs> This club for many, many years has always had one eye on the Football League. So really, what's happening, been happening to us in you know, the last few months since since May, we've been pretty well prepared for that. Uh, will you shed a tear just before kick-off, do you think? Not really, no. I think, because I think when you're involved, as I am, you know, I'm involved uh, very much during the week. I'm here every day, you know, on a match day. Uh, I have certain routines to perform, you know. So, oh, uh, don't be so hard-fished. <laughs> you can let yourself go. You've worked at this club for 35 years, for goodness sake. You're in the football league. A little bit of moisture, please. Mm, no, because it's a long way to go, isn't it? You know, I'll th come and talk to me after the game if we've got three points, you know. Might shed a tear then. comes we saw you an hour and a half ago what yeah. have you just said we're two minutes to go what have you just said to the boys just go out there and enjoy it simple as that simple as that not quite but that's all i'm going to tell you and how are the nerves you're all bunched up a bit now um no i'll be all right once the uh, whistle goes and uh, i see that we start well then i'll be fine good luck go and meet Thanks. your new public cheers all the best New boys Burton Albion looking for their first win in the league couldn't have asked for more generous opponents. Morecambe are shipping goals all over the place and they were behind after just three minutes. Greg Pearson with Albion's first home goal in the Football League. The second followed soon after. Burton's record signing Russell Penn taking advantage of more lacklustre defending to claim his first goal for his new club. The Shrimps might have problems defending but they're a different proposition going forward. A minute after falling two behind, they were back in business. A beautifully crafted build-up and an excellent finish from Ian Craney, one of two Morecambe players on loan from Huddersfield. But at the other end, more calamitous defending enabled Sean Harrod to restore Burton's two-goal advantage. Harrod's goals have been key in getting Burton into the Football League. This was his first at this level, and you can see what it meant to him. The name Morecambe is synonymous with comedy, of course, but manager Sammy McElroy presumably didn't see the funny side of Danny Adams' hapless foul on Greg Pearson. A penalty for the home side, Pearson picking himself up to claim his second of the match, Burton's fourth. 
Morecambe weren't finished and they pulled it back to 4-2 through Phil Jevons. Like Craney, Jevons is also on loan from Huddersfield. Clearly they've got quality to spare. But there was still time for Morecambe to concede their 12th goal of the campaign. John McGrath taking full advantage of some statuesque defending. The Shrimps later had Mark Duffy sent off too. Worrying times for them, but what a day for Burton Albion. What are you going to do for your next trick? Oh, no. Let's hope we win, eh? No, it's been a great day. I've absolutely enjoyed it. It's been brilliant. And the fans I was hearing there all singing Pessy's Yeah, it's nice. It's very nice. You, you think when you're uh, a player and you finish the those days will be gone, but thank you very much to the supporters here. They've been brilliant today, and to have them chat my name is wonderful. And is it a sense of relief inside? Yes, huge day? relief. Now we can really relax, enjoy our football, and uh, build on it. Good luck for the thank rest you. of the season. Cheers. Well, and Paul and Burton. Now, Notts County made a statement on and off the field this week after winning their opening league two match 5 0. They ran Championship side Doncaster close in the Carling Cup. Well, now they've signed Manchester City goalkeeper Casper Schmeichel on a five year deal for an undisclosed fee believed to be a club record. Schmeichel, of course, worked under Sven Joran Eriksson at Manchester City. Well, Schmeichel watched from the stands today as Sven saw his Notts County team put in another top display, this time at Macclesfield. Another League Two cruise for Notts County. Ricky Ravenhill netted the opener after Lee Hughes had seen his effort blocked. The midfielder's first goal for the club. Shortly before half-time, it became unlikely there'd be any way back for Macclesfield as Stephen Hunt extended County's lead. The game was up for good five minutes after the break as Ben Davis' delivery was turned past his own keeper by Ben Wright. Ian McParland's men couldn't quite match the five they put past Bradford last week, but four on the road's not bad. Craig Westcar wrapped up the win and County are yet to concede in the league. No wonder Casper's looking forward to the job. They're going to do everything they can to, to make sure this club goes forward, really. That's, uh, that was the main promise and that was the most important one for me, you know, to see the commitment from, from, from up, to, up to from board level and then today onto the pitch. Good times for County fans. Right, here's the rest of the League 2 action. In the league, Bournemouth have picked up where they left off last season. Three victories at the back end of that campaign, followed by last week's opening day success at Bury. True, they got trounced by League One Millwall in the Cup, but maybe that was just a blip. Ryan Gary's first senior goal brought Rotherham back to earth with a bump after their surprise midweek win over Derby. Eight goals at Victoria Road, where the home side made it two wins out of two this season. Peter Gain, who didn't score a single goal throughout the whole of the last campaign, put the daggers ahead on 18 minutes. Danny Green then scored twice inside 60 seconds early in the second half to kill the game off. First, he drilled home from outside the area with a sweet strike that barely left the turf, and he added another just seconds later with another impressive finish which gave goalkeeper Scott Bevan no chance. Manager John Still has been busy raiding non-league football for talent and Green's debut goals in League Two suggest a bright future at this level. Torquay, though, were thrown a lifeline in the 61st minute after Mark Arbour fouled Elliot Benyon in the area. Nicky Rowe made no mistake from the spot. But Josh Scott, another non-league gem unearthed by Still, restored the three-goal lead with a deft back heel from Green's corner. The scoring wasn't finished yet, though. Benyon reducing the deficit with a cheeky 82nd-minute far-post flick. And the Devon side gave themselves real hope of an unlikely comeback when Gambian Mustafa Karayol spectacularly let fly from a mile out to score his first goal for the club with three minutes left on the clock. With Torquay pressing for an equaliser, the Daggers secured the points deep in stoppage time. Wesley Thomas swivelling to fire home his first goal in professional football. What a thriller. Barnett's mascots have more sting than the team since mid-April. Six games without a win spanning the seasons. 
and within a couple of minutes the run looks set to continue. Nathan Alder's header meant Shrewsbury could show off a well-rehearsed routine. Barnett refused to accept their fate and were back in business when Albert Adoma was tripped. A situation that called for a wise old head. 40-year-old Paul Furlong stepped up. Chris Neal defied the veteran striker. Instead, it was a man at the other end of the experienced spectrum who saved the day for Barnett. 19-year-old Jake Hyde's first senior goal drew the home side level. And the next time they needed someone to take a penalty, the former Swindon trainee was in the mood. Hyde had won the spot kick and did the honours himself. But this was a Jekyll and Hyde performance from Barnett. Dave Hibbert headed his third goal in as many matches. And while Shrewsbury remain unbeaten, the Bees missed out on that elusive win. Rochdale claimed their first victory of the season despite playing the majority of the match against Aldershot Town with just 10 men. After only 15 minutes, Nathan Stanton was shown the fifth red card of his career and his fourth in Dale Colours for pulling back Marvin Morgan. But the Hampshire side failed to take advantage of their extra man and they were made to pay in the final minute of stoppage time when the luckless Adam Hinshelwood was adjudged to have handled Chris Dagnall's shot. The unfortunate Hinshelwood conceded two penalties on Tuesday night against Bristol Rovers and his third misdemeanour inside a week was punished by Tom Kennedy's well-struck spot kick. Chapman fans are starting to see the best of Alvis Hammond, who's finally shaken off the ankle trouble that blighted his first season with the club. A superb individual effort from the striker, who also scored in midweek against South End. But teenager Johnny Godsmark is fast becoming a Hereford favourite. Fresh from knocking Charlton out of the Carling Cup with his midweek winner, the lad on loan from Newcastle salvaged a point. Quakers entertained Shakers at Darlington Arena, where visiting Berry claimed all three points with a 59th minute goal from Jordan Robertson, who just joined them on loan from Sheffield United. Darlington looked short on confidence, still searching for their first point of the season. They could have put that right in the final minute when Berry keeper Wayne Brown brought down substitute Curtis Main after fumbling across. The penalty was entrusted to old warhorse Dean Windus, but the Darlow assistant manager scuffed his effort. This wasn't his or Darlington's day. In the three years since league football returned to Accrington, the Stanley fans had never seen a win over Lincoln. That changed courtesy of central defender Darren Kempson. Lincoln manager Peter Jackson said he was baffled by his team's poor performance, admitting they deserved to lose. Though the Imps very nearly pinched a draw through Joe Heath. Alan Martin's acrobatics ensured a fair result. At home for the first time this season, Bradford City were hoping to avoid a hat-trick of defeats in League and Cup and three straight without a goal. It wasn't to be. The closest they came was in stoppage time. New signing James Hansen thwarted by Chris Martin. Vale couldn't find a way through either. A suffocating game ended up nil-nil. Grimsby fans must be fearing another season of struggle after slumping to a heavy defeat in their first home appearance. Calvin Zola had crew in control by half-time, his first goal given despite some half-hearted Grimsby appeals, but no arguments about the second. Lovely footwork and a great ball from Byron Moore, finished with a perfect header. Zola started the season in style, he also scored against Blackpool in midweek while Grimsby were getting hammered by Tranmere. The Mariners lost that cup tie 4-0 and were heading for the same again once Moore was brought down by Nick Hegarty. Billy Jones extended Crewe's lead. The skipper's handy with a dead ball but let Amon Verma take the last minute free kick which clattered the woodwork before Moore wrapped up Grimsby's miserable afternoon.
Chesterfield lost their opener at Torquay United last weekend but arrived at their Saltergate home in high spirits. They were even happier after just seven minutes when Donald McDermott's cross was headed home by Drew Talbot. But the celebrations proved to be premature. Referee Steve Rushton had seen something he didn't like. The goal didn't stand. But after 32 minutes, a goal nobody could argue with. McDermott fed by Jack Lester and the Irish teenager who's on loan from Manchester City scoring his first ever goal in professional football. On this evidence, it won't be his last. Chesterfield 1, Northampton Town 0. Yeah, Steve just telling me there he's pretty impressed with Chesterfield and he, they could do well this season. But what about Dagenham and Redbridge? Five goals at home for them today. Fantastic. Uh, I mean... John Steele's been there a while. They've only just come out of the non-leagues. He's and an he's, expert on the lower He league, does. He knows, he knows where to get a bargain. He knows a little gem outside of the professional game. And uh, that stood him in good stead and they've had a fantastic start. And a word on Bournemouth v Rotherham. Bournemouth coming out on top this time, yeah. but this time last year they were both on minus figures, weren't well, they? Well, it was all about survival last year. It looks like uh, you know, they've uh, set their sights a little higher this, this season. Bournemouth started well and Rotherham won't be far away because Mark Robbins... Has, uh, has done a very, very good job. There. Two very talented managers. Absolutely. All right, high time we pay our last visit of the evening to Jackie for your emails and texts. Jackie. Yes, Manish, Joe in Nottingham saying the mighty Notts County were the butt of many people's jokes when Sven came to Meadow Lane. 5-0 and 4-0 so far. Who's laughing now? Sven's presence will guide County to promotion from Dave Bevan in Notts as well. Amo Kumar, I'm delighted by Sven Joran Eriksson's involvement in the club, but can't help feeling sorry for Ian Charlie McParland. As if the club succeeds, Sven will get the credit, or as if they fail, Ian will get the blame. As long as we keep winning and keep at the top, I'll be over the moon. That's the first over the moon we've had of the new season, I think, so far. Lee Hughes is an amazing striker. Uh, Chris Fletcher, I'm a proud Burton Albion fan celebrating our first Football League victory in our 59-year history. Nigel Clough and now Paul Pesky Salido are top managers and I think on today's performance we will stay up. A little bit more doom and gloom though from Adam Shaw of Stockport. Alarm bells are ringing at Stockport this week. 1,000 down on attendance and a very weak performance from a very young side. We need to come out of administration, sign some players or we'll definitely be relegated this season. OK, thanks very much, Jackie. Thanks indeed to you at home as well for all your emails and text messages. Let's take a quick check at the league tables then after week two of the league season. What a fantastic start for Notts County and Ian McParlin and the help of a certain Swede. Two wins out of two for them. They've scored nine goals after their first 180 minutes of league football. And of course, uh, two wins as well for Bournemouth and Eddie Howe and for Dagenham and Redbridge as well. At the bottom of the Football League, it's looking pretty grim for Grimsby without a point to their name as is the case for Colin Todd's Darlington. OK, looking at the top of League One and Colchester for the second week running top the league with a 100% record well into Charlton under Phil Parkinson and to Leeds, of course, one of the favourites for promotion this season. At the bottom of League One, Southampton, after humbling, uh, or humble, of course, by Huddersfield, they remain on minus nine and Wickham the only team in the division without a point to their name. At the top of the championship, well, at the start of the season, Chris Coleman was bemoaning the lack of strength of his squad. Well, they've not done too badly, have they? Two wins out of two. They're the only team in the championship to boast such a good record. OK, don't forget, at the bottom, Swansea, they're the only team without a point to their name. Paolo Sosa may be finding the going tough, but it's early days, of course, at the Liberty Stadium. We're on the red button as soon as we're off air, right through till midday on Sunday. Don't forget also to check our fabulous BBC website for extensive highlights of your team in action. We're also on the BBC iPlayer from Monday morning. OK, well, that's your lot. Don't forget Match of the Day tomorrow night, 10 o'clock on BBC Two. My thanks to Steve and to Jackie. We'll see you at 11.40 next Saturday, straight after Match of the Day. Good night.